welcome everybody for joining in, chipping in. Uh, thank you everybody for, for being with us today. So this, uh, today is one of the initiatives that we've been talking about for a little while, and we want to bring effectively two different perspectives to the table on two different topics. So cloud, cybersecurity, and in general, DevSecOps. And we, we talked and we discussed a little bit with uh, members in that you have here, Stephen, Ben, and Owanate, on how to deliver best this, uh, if you want, conversation. And we want to keep it as a conversation of two people that are practitioner, myself and Stephen, and two people that are really, really heavily involved with the recruitment. So to give effectivity to prospective on the work, uh, what are the job out there, what are the challenge, how to upskill. So we're gonna focus uh, fundamentally on what is the cloud, uh, what is the certification that you can do, what are the uh, places and training. And we want this to be uh, a sharing forum where we provide as many resources as we can on how you can upskill in this challenging time to get into cloud security, into cloud, uh, and uh, upskill yourself fundamentally to be prepared. So before we kick off, uh, we're gonna do five minutes introduction, then we're gonna open up the panel to the discussions, uh, and then we're gonna wrap up uh, with q uh, and uh, Q&A and uh, five minutes for closing for next event, logistics and uh, CSA UK recruitment as well. <laughs> so who is CSA UK? So we are a local chapter of Cloud Security Alliance. The Cloud Security Alliance is a non-for-profit that uh, aims to share knowledge about cloud security, to outreach, to do research, and uh, we started uh, with an initial set of certification called uh, um, cybersecurity uh, cloud um, uh, based knowledge effectively the CCSK. Um, apologize that um, I hate the acron acronyms, <laughs> so sometimes I forget it. Um, but we started with that certification as a base knowledge for cloud security, and it's vendor agnostic, so it can be applied to all the vendors. And we, from that, uh, it derived. Uh, the cloud control matrix, a certification, uh, a set of control for the cloud uh, that was uh, community born to effectively assess how secure is a cloud provider. And from that, a star alliance that effectively is a, uh, an equivalent of, if you want, ISO 27001, but for the cloud, the certified that the cloud meets uh, the cloud control matrix. Um, what we do as a local chapter, we do a lot of research, we do a lot of webinars to extend uh, our knowledge and we do academic outreach uh, and we have an annual gateway meeting that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. So some of the activity, as I said, uh, we do mentoring, we do research and, and we're open for proposals. So we do a lot of white paper, one pager, two pager or blog posts. So if you have a very interesting topic in terms of cloud, cloud security, um, please reach out to us and uh, we are on Twitter and LinkedIn. We have a group and a page right now and we are on CSA UK chapter on Twitter. So get in touch with us if you want to do some more research, if you want to get involved. As I said, it's a non-for-profit and we are here to help the community to get better at cloud and security. Uh, just a little bit of a mention, we are running our virtual, uh, our annual meetings or so annual conference. Uh, we were aiming to do it physically, but due to the fact of COVID and the current situation, we're being careful and we will host it at the moment online. It's on the 22 September. Uh, we are open to effectively uh, talks. So if you're interested in talking, please submit a call, uh, call for paper. There is uh, the link in there for the website. You can drop it in there, uh, your call, uh, your presentation proposal, and we will evaluate. Uh, just an overview of uh, the board. Uh, we are trying to be as diverse as possible, and we're trying to be um, yeah, we're pushing for diversity. We are not 100% of my 50% of board commitments uh, a bit more diverse, but we're going to get there. So please join us, contribute. And let's crack on. So that was pretty much it from uh, the chapter. So as I said, this forum is to have a nice and flowing discussion with people that are experts in the field, people that are practitioners, 
myself, Stephen, and people that are really, really involved in the recruitment space uh, from uh, two of our lead experts, Ben and one other that I'm going to introduce you in a second. So a little bit about myself, I'm Francesco Cipollone, and I'd like to welcome again everybody. I'm the director of NSC42, that is a cybersecurity consultancy based in the UK. Uh, I'm very passionate about cybersecurity, about events. Uh, I don't know if you see me somewhere else, but I'm very, very present on the why. I like to talk, actually I love to talk, so reach out to me. Um, I'm going to talk about a few of the activities, but uh, without talking too much about myself, let me... Um, uh, introduce, uh, and of course, I'm the chair of the Health Security Alliance UK. <laughs> but let me introduce uh, to Stephen. Thanks, Frank. Um, Stephen Owen, I'm very passionate about security, cloud, privacy, um, and with a different level of experience through lots of different projects from on premise migration to the cloud, working also for cloud providers, Oracle in the past. So that was an experience. and very passionate about Azure and AWS. Um, and it's just an ever ongoing learning experience. So I think one of the things you'll take away today, it just never stops. You're continually learning. So if you're passionate and you enjoy security and want to broaden your scope and your career, I think this is a good starting point. Thank you very much, Stephen, and I absolutely sign, sign up to everything that you said, it's continuous learning, that's what we hear. But we also want to hear from the recruitment perspective, so Ben, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi everybody, I'm Ben Craig, I'm the Principal Consultant at InfoSec People, a boutique cybersecurity recruitment consultancy based out of Cheltenham, of all places. Um, I am also the Director of Communications for the Cloud Security Alliance. Um, which has been very helpful from a learning perspective for myself. Uh, similarly to Steve and Francesco, I am I'm extremely passionate about cybersecurity. I find it absolutely fascinating that there are people out there like Steve and Francesco, Lewis, and, and many others, of course, including Paul, who stop uh, the bad guys, you know, um, taking advantage of, of, of honest, hardworking people and businesses. Uh, so much so I actually got my CIS MP earlier on this year. Um, so so yeah, really enjoying being part of the CSA and and very happy that we're we're having this talk about today about how we bring through uh, the next generation of security professionals into what is quite a uh, an interesting industry. Thank you very much, Ben. And I have to say, I'm really. Uh... I'm really happy that a few people that are not just security practitioner comes into the space because security is everybody's job, as I keep on repeating in every my presentation. So it's great to have more and more people joining in and deepening in the tools in cybersecurity. And specifically from the, recruit, recruit, the recruitment perspective, from my perspective, I really appreciate having a conversation with somebody that actually is deeply involved in security and actually has that understanding and it doesn't get completely you know, it doesn't get lost in the jargon whenever I'm having a conversation as a hiring manager or as a, as a person being recruited. But uh, without further ado, let me introduce least but not last, uh, our fantastic uh, uh, other recruiter Owen at Bestman. Do you want to give yourself an introduction? Hi, I'm Owen Arte Bestman. I'm the founder and director of Bestman Solutions. Um, uh, frame I set up recently to respond to the uh, security requirements, uh, the recruitment requirements within security. Um, I've been in corporate security recruitment now for approximately 15 years, and the last seven have been dedicated to cyber security, and um, both in a technical and GRC capacity. I also work with CISOs and heads of departments to look at trends that might affect their um, future hiring requirements. And I'm also affiliated with a number of uh, security associations. So thank you very much, Wanate. So let's crack on. So why do we need security? So and and one organization should care. Well, I ju just try to capture here a, a couple of metrics that is effectively the impact uh, in terms of number of things being breached and the the numbers of impact of a breach. So we've seen, uh, for example, of recent some organization being being popped and being owned and being sold. Um, and some others that will uh, struggle. So the, the most recent one uh, I, I think we all hear about is EasyJet, uh, of which right now we have 
uh, we're going to have the lawsuits in place and uh, there are going to be consequences from a GDPR perspective. So the, the, the threat is real. The threat is not just about uh, losing customer data, losing face, but it's actually really important from a monetary perspective. And you see more or less a trend that uh, organizations spend or will spend uh, roughly $3 million of dollars as an impact of a breach. And the cost is going more and more because the complexity is going more and more and more people are interested in actually uh, unfortunately being lucrative on this. Uh, readers lawyers and readers class action and readers GDPR start having kids. So you see an uptrending in terms of cost. So the impact of a breach, the impact of uh, effectively losing your data uh, is high. And because we don't, the, the cloud is relatively new it is, it is relatively young and this is just a, a timeline of uh, when service was uh, were born and uh, you see effectively a speed from 2006 onward in the cloud but it's relatively sorry it's relatively a new thing the cloud fundamentally so we are still upscaling we're still getting up to speed with all these nuances of cloud and what what cloud security means and the majority of problem is misconfiguration because we don't have enough knowledge about cloud security and cloud is still a complex world. So you have an enormous amount of tools available at your disposal to invent, to create new business, but also an enormous amount of tools to actually screw up. <laughs> so it's really easy. And one of actually the biggest trends that we see with the Cloud Security Alliance in terms of breaches is uh, misconfiguration. Read us uh, an S3 bucket in Amazon uh, without uh, with public access. So you think cloud is private, but cloud is just uh, the, the, most of the services are actually indexed over the web. So it's a mindset shift and is a, is, is a rethinking some of these services as they are. Effectively, is service is server on the web, public accessible unless you put some restriction, unless you configure it properly. And I want to demystify the, the, the whole trend that says uh, cloud is inherently secure or insecure. Cloud is just a tool and the use that you make of it is going to determine if it's secure or not. So if you put your server on the web completely publicly accessible, that server is unsecure. If you put, if you put uh, uh, an EC2 instance from Amazon completely available with the web, that server is insecure in the same exact way. So it's our job as security professional to make sure that first of all, most of the people get this kind of knowledge of what security is and the paradigm shift uh, that is not a private data center anymore but also to secure effectively the cloud and to protect our customer because it's our responsibility so from a security perspective what is the landscape and i wanted to keep this uh, slide to give you a perception of how big wide and 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 deep is the cybersecurity space. And you could be effectively as a cybersecurity professional involved in a little bit on data security, application security, endpoints, network security, perimeter security. And then depending on where your infrastructure lies, you can be in public cloud or private cloud. And you need to have a little bit of nuance around this thing. And the higher you go in the, um, and effectively the management chain, the more you need to know, but the less expert you need to be. So my recommendation is generally speaking, uh, have a broad understanding of what those topics are and what each one do they mean so that you can have a conversation with all the relevant stakeholders and the relevant people, but be an expert or become an expert or see where your passion drives you. And uh, specifically in the cloud, all these elements get meshed up together. So it's even more important to have a good understanding of a little bit of everything. So data security, endpoint security, network security, perimeter security in the cloud, they all get matched together. And uh, the speed at which a service can get deployed in the cloud uh, makes uh, the experience and the knowledge of this field even more important from a cybersecurity profession. So I have the pleasure now to, to leave uh, the conversation to uh, one other Ben to talk a little bit about uh, the current landscape of uh, cybersecurity role. Uh, what are the challenge from a recruitment perspective? So I'm going to shut up and leave the <laughs> and pass the presenter to Ben and one other. 
never get tired of hearing from you, Francesco. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, my yeah. voice is as charming. Don't go good voice. You've got. <laughs> Um, here we see before us uh, a range of roles with quite a wide salary um, and a scope within these positions. Naturally, the CISO um, is at the top of this. Um, now, what I'd like to address are the key factors that could be in the discrepancies between, if we see a security architect, between 75K to 140K. Um, the probably the number one um, factor in this is actually the industry sector that can determine um, what kind of salary um, someone can um, expect as well as seniority. Um, the DCMS did a very comprehensive uh, report uh, and publication. Uh, it was published in March this year, and it found that um, the financial services do pay the best. It's something that we recruiters pretty much new, but it, it's good to see that um, evidence. And um, also the level of responsibility. Um, there are senior security architects and there are less senior security architects. I mean, I've never really come across a junior enterprise security architect, um, shall we say. And um, also levels of stakeholder management um, is also a key factor in what kind of salary you can expect. Most security positions these days do it, you would expect a level of stakeholder um, engagement, but it's not certainly not unknown for enterprise security architects to engage with even some of the regulators. So that level and that command of authority can also drive up um, the uh, requirements as well as your ability to negotiate on that salary. So sometimes a good recruiter can come in handy um, in that. No, no sales pitch there. Um, also, location um, as well. From the report, it was found that 35.5% of the security positions advertised were actually in London. Um, second to that location was the Southeast, and that was 16.8%. So the demand often uh, demands uh, the salary in respect to that. Now, to address the elephant in the room here, we are all working from home and we could, um, there could be a position in Edinburgh and an applicant from London could be perfectly feasible for that role, especially if it's a contract position because he or she would be expected to work remotely. So it's a little bit early to see how that is going to affect the, um, uh, the salary demands, whether that would bring that down or whether that would level level it out, but that would be the explanation for the broad um, scale, the broad salary range um, that we see um, present. Um, what are your thoughts, Ben? I'll mute Ben and I'll mute myself. I um, I think you've raised some really good, strong points there, Owen Arty. Um, and and you're right. I think that the salaries are very much specific to the location of the hiring client. I think one of the things that we probably need to look at as well, and maybe you know challenge the norm, is what clients expect for the salary that they're offering, and and is there opportunities? I would say to bring through perhaps people who have a great um, skill set initially that might not be perfectly matched to that role but that they could embed themselves in and within six months be, say, a £50,000 a year security architect, but within six months be that £70,000 a year guy. So I think that is something that I would possibly look to challenge from a client perspective as well. We'll move to the next slide. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, audio is good. Okay, great. Fantastic. Now, this next slide is quite self-explanatory. Um, I do like the phrase of um, golden unicorns. For anyone who doesn't understand that, another phrase you could use are Jedi masters. Um, <laughs> the DevSecOps are what we often call the creme de la creme um, within the cloud space. Um, these are individuals that can work alongside the um, DevOps team 
and can um, implement security uh, by design. Now, these with most of these positions have one key thing in common, um, not just the fact that they're, they're working in a um, cloud environment and capacity, but they're also setting key skills, the ability to code, the ability to understand coding, to work with the developers, whether that be, um, uh, whether that be Java or Python. Um, and I'd like to talk about the contract rate attached to these positions as well, because there is a very strong contract market. We've seen that somewhat decline with the current environment, um, but the DevSecOps can be a very contract-led um, market. And you are looking at daily rates from about 700 to 800 pounds a day for these individuals, um, on not too dissimilar from the security cloud architecture, roughly um, the same. Now, I have seen that come down somewhat. I'd put that down to perhaps a few more candidates um, on the market. Um, and for DevOps uh, daily rate, you're looking at around between 550 to 650 um, on average. Um, in terms of key skills on these individuals, uh, obviously containerization experience, either at Docker or Kubernetes. Um, also platform-led um, experience. When we do work these kind of positions, I often find that hiring managers, they lean towards a certain um, platform experience, but namely AWS, Azure, or um, Google Cloud. And one of the challenges we face is perhaps opening up the horizons, opening up the minds of the hiring managers um, to perhaps upskill um, these, these individuals. But when it comes to contract <laughs> opportunities, it's often a case of they want everything that ticks uh, the box. Um, I don't know if you would like to add anything to that, Ben, and uh, add your thoughts to that. No, I, I no, I think you've raised again some some very strong points, uh, and and again, you're right. The contract um, marketplace, whilst has had its challenges recently, is still quite buoyant in in those really key key areas, as you mentioned, DevSecOps and cloud security architecture. I suppose with most businesses that are going through, you know, very, very rapid digitization programs, of course, securing the cloud and having people that have that knowledge and skill set that can come in and, and you know, offer, you know, um, their expertise from day one to ensure that call center teams can can access their CRMs via clouds and, and securely um, is, is a huge thing at the moment. So that is where the contractor day rate is still quite high, of course. Um, even even with the challenges, but again, very good points. We go on to the next slide, please. So so this is where we're of course looking for, um, you know, positioning yourself to a hiring manager um, for cloud security careers, or or of course working working with a recruiter to ensure that they're doing this for you. So there's, there's various different key elements that, that uh, I personally believe in um, that will help you secure a career in this area. Now, focusing on technical skills, of course, that is very much uh, a, a gimme, should we say. But what I would be sort of really telling my, my, my candidates to do in this space is actually look at future proofing their technical skills as well. And ensuring that they're ahead of the curve with any key changes to the industry that they feel uh, and, the, and the market says will be um, advantageous within a six to 18 month period. If we look at things like DevSecOps three, four years ago, um, of course, where, where would that, what conversations would have been taking place back then? Uh, and of course, we've seen how much that has rose to prominence over the last 12 to 18 months. When we say, um, taking a consultative approach. This is something that I stress to every single candidate I speak with before an interview. Um, and what we mean by this is when you're having an interview, don't just simply answer questions. You know, th th those conversations have to be two ways. I normally say, imagine that you're going into a business that you're, that you're already working for and there's a challenge. How do you understand the challenge? How do you find out what is uh, integral to that business and then relay your skills back to that hiring manager giving solid um, examples of when you've done that in your in your previous uh, employment uh, and make them believe of course 
that, that you're the person that can take them through those challenges and, and that you will understand the business needs um, moving forward. Um, which takes us quite nicely actually onto communication. I think that we're all aware that um, technology is often seen as an industry with dark rooms and bright screens and, and people with their head down um, coding. But actually, I think that as things move on more and more, um, that, that the communication element is, is just as important in some cases as the technical skills, because just because you have those, that, you know, that, those technical elements to, to your arsenal, how can you fully um, support a business if you can't communicate those challenges back that you're finding yourself? And then, and then when we sort of look at, you know, what sort of businesses would you be looking to work for? I would say that people who have worked multi-sectors have a slight advantage in the sense that they understand security from different environments. You know, we often see financial organizations saying to us, the, the person that we hire must have financial experience, which is, which is true to, to an element. However, what I would say for any candidate that is very much looking to, to get into this space would be look at employers that you could actually see yourself enjoying the work as well and actually understanding that regulation and moving forward and becoming a real SME in, say, cloud security, DevSecOps, um, or, or, or some of the more you know, traditional cyber roles out there that you might have those skills, but actually more importantly, being an SME of an environment such as finance, insurance, telecoms, or, or, or something like that. And I think that will really help build a, a strong career picture for you moving forward. Uh, I don't know if you've got anything else to add on that Owen Arte or challenge. Nothing to challenge, agree with that. Um, what I would add is that um, as someone looking for a position, it's what's really, um, what stands you apart is taking that interest into the industry sector that you are actually working with and the implications of how moving to the cloud affects that, especially in this day and age. I mean, as an extreme example, um, Deliveroo, um, their, um, their commercial use of the cloud and how they've been able to advertise that and increase sales and be a real market leader during this time um, in comparison to, for example, Primark that doesn't even have a digital presence that is going to suffer. Um, so all in all, you're working for an organization that either is there to um, make money or it could be not for profit. So you need to have a commercial acumen um, and that and take a vested interest um, and, 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 and how cloud implementation is going to affect that particular organization and that particular industry sector. So not only is that more likely to secure the position, from my experience, it's also more likely to aid you in progressing through that potential through in that organization because you are showing the commercial acumen and necessary to move up the ranks so you know technology has an end point has an end goal and uh, it's good not to forget that yeah i agree yeah looking at this looking at the industry sectors that you know will, will, will thrive uh, in years to come and as you quite rightly say looking at businesses that have those online presences of course are, are always going to far outweigh those that are still very much expected on the physical presence such as as Primark as you mentioned there which again I think brings us quite nicely on to the next slide which is you know, there's over 300 uh, sorry 3,000 um, vacancies on LinkedIn across cloud security in the UK at the moment if we're being completely honest a lot of recruiters um, are possibly advertising jobs that don't exist so so probably be aware of that it's uh, it's something that does happen unfortunately so so perhaps uh, when you are engaging with a recruiter that say they've got the next best job in cloud security just ensure your your sanity checking yourself and of course making sure there's a real opportunity um that would be something key i would sort of say um but of course we, we're seeing throughout the market that the emergence of cloud vacancies mean that that employers uh, and hiring managers are looking also for those you know transferable skills to address the skills gap because rightly or wrongly it's seen that cyber has a has this mysterious skills gap um which i agree with only to a point i think that there there is an awful lot of um relevant skills that people possess um that aren't possibly um taken on board due to the fact that everybody almost wants 
those skills now that they're preferably doing for a competitor that they can come in from day one. But I do think that there is, you know, that perceived skills gap in, in some cases. Um, as we put here, some of the, the key employers hiring in the cloud space, uh, you know, the government organizations are always looking for these skill sets. You know, consultancies, I work with a number of smaller SME consultancies that regularly say to me, Ben, I need a cloud security architect for one to three months. Can you can you support me uh, on a contract basis? And then, of course, the more traditional um organizations you know insurance and banking it will always be key in these areas just purely for the online presence that they possess and of course various different ways they consider that their customers can bank and 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 you know purchase their products as well um and and then telecoms of course um so so there are a number of various companies in different sectors that employ these skills on a on a regular basis one of the things that i would like to add you know, we sort of touched on the recruitment elements is quite often companies that don't understand the skill set will often go out, you know, find themselves going out to agencies to actually fulfill the requirement. So what I would say is when that happens, and if you do find yourself speaking to a, you know, a recruitment consultant with a shameless plug to either myself or Arte moving forward, <laughs> um, then of course you are speaking with recruiters that do understand the sector, understand security and actually what it is that you do. Because part of our job and part of the challenge that I face on a daily basis is when I speak to candidates in this space that say, I've spoken to a recruitment consultant for half an hour and then I never hear from them again. Um, or, or even worse still, they use me to find leads for other opportunities. So just ensure that you're working with a, a, a recruiter that has a good reputation. You can do that by looking on their LinkedIn profiles or doing a bit of digging on the um, the business page, as you would if you were looking to apply for a company directly, uh, and just ensure that that the opportunities they're representing are real, um, and of course they have a firm grasp on your skills and how they can represent you to a potential employer. Because I feel that if they can do that, then you'll find that you actually get better results. Uh, and when you go through to interview, you'll have a better understanding of the role, what's required, and then it really is just a case of that personality fit to ensure that you're happy with them. And of course, they are with you to move you through to the next stage. That's probably what I'd like to add um, as, as a final summary, really. What about yourself, Nati? Yeah, just to um, add to the range of vacancies um, you've listed across different industry sectors, for anyone that's tuned in that's not technical, they don't necessarily need to worry too much um, because there's a large percentage of um, cloud-based positions that actually, or cloud-motivated positions that actually aren't technical within themselves. Um, Firemon did a study um, last year and the number one blocker at that time for organizations moving into the public cloud was compliance. The internal compliance and also compliance with the regulators. So I worked on what I call GRC positions, governance, risk and compliance positions. Um, that were motivated by cloud implementation. So there is the technical route to work within cloud, but there's also a um, non-technical route, if you will. I'd like to add to that. Yeah, no, thank you very, very much for the for the outlook. And I, I, I strongly agree on a few points. Like you say, Owana Day is not uh, a job for just one specific people, one specific set of people, and the Cloud Security Alliance is catching up with this and is publishing a completely new certification that we're going to talk in a second called CCAK, that is effectively a certified uh, security cloud auditor. Regulation is a very big blocker, but also an enabler for certain cybersecurity programs. But as Ben said, there is a sort of kind of shortage in skill and Stephen will walk us through, for example, position like DevSecOps where that mix of skills effectively comes in place. But I, I really appreciate you guys and your perspective, but let me pass the presenter to our uh, DevSecOps expert of, of, of uh, this session, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, <clears throat> we could talk hours about, we call it a pipeline, a life cycle. This is part of the duties of DevSecOps. So I think the guys earlier on mentioned what some of the key attributes of DevSecOps 
I think one of the key ones is to be able to co communicate. So I've hired in, in the past several different types of DevSecOps, and I've always, I called it, forward deployed them. They are part of the DevOps team. So they're not sitting amongst the security team, they are amongst the DevOps team and working with the project managers or the operational key. So communication and breaking down barriers, depending on the organization is really, really key. And it grows and confidence grows as well. Um, but one of the key areas of DevSecOps, we call it a pipeline. And in security, there's I sometimes call it a hamster wheel. There's always a life cycle. It goes a full path. So it's not a the you write a piece of code, I might be writing a piece of Java or Python, and I commit it, and that's it, and somebody else deploys it. With DevOps and DevSecOps, you're more living the process. You'll develop something, deploy it, and it'll go through certain hoops and testing, and then go to deployment. But part of the DevSecOps is ingraining security into this pipeline. And we have a mantra, if you do it once, twice, well, try and automate it. If you're doing something three or four times, you try and get it into the pipeline, so you're almost hands off, and the security testing is part of this life cycle process. But again, part of this life cycle is you might be working with the DevOps team and trying to get them more skilled up. So again, the communication is trying to encourage them to write as a writing code is to develop best practices. And also you're putting in a bit of a governance risk compliance hat on it, making sure if they're going to adopt, for example, some Docker uh, or Kubernetes images that we call it provenance, they're taken from the right locations because often we're seeing now that with this cloud pipeline process, if I want to compromise somebody, I go back to the well and poison that well, that image. So as people bake in the security, I've planted my seeds in there. So this is where the DevSecOps is making sure security is built in. Um, and it's an ex exciting space that you could constantly be working in this life cycle. And you might be supporting or working in a team of 10, 15 DevOps or three or four people. It might be transitioning an old on-premise application of a client into the cloud, or it could be a totally serverless or a Docker, which is halfway between. So you might need different skills, and sometimes you can't be a master of all, so it's constantly learning different techniques, and you're all, yeah, different techniques. So next slide. This is breaking it down a bit further when I mentioned about the team. So what you, we always, what, what we're trying to do is we say moving left. So as I'm, as the DevOps teams are developing, we're trying to implant some different security tooling. Um, it, again, it depends on the organization. It depends on the security budget. So in the past, we've had to, I've had to grow different budgets. So I might say to the DevSecOps team, start gently, start looking for credentials. People, de developers may have embedded their, their credentials to databases, for example, into the code itself, which isn't really best practice. So one is starting to detect that and also encourage, in, we don't beat the developers, DevOps team, your colleagues with a stick. It's understanding why they've done it perhaps encourage them, perhaps have you looked at the different techniques of handling, we call it secrets and credentials. And so you work with them and the next project or future, they take that pattern, that way of doing it and embed it, oh, I've got that library, I've done it before, I know how to resolve it. So you're always trying to build for the future of the building blocks to encourage the DevOps encourage them. So again, it's that communication. There are off the shelf tooling. So if we look at the scanning and vulnerability, this is one of the key areas of living the life cycle is you, it could be a third party or an open source tool of code analysis tools. 
So the static tools, it's more about code quality and dynamic tools. So it's analyzing if you were to run the program where the security concerns may be. Often as well, you know, this is where you'd work with a cloud security architect because the cloud security architect will have a broader perspective of how the application works and some of the out, outward facing security controls that he may work with the DevSecOps as well. And in the past, the DevSecOps might also be the, the eyes and ears for the CISO as well. So I've worked in the past that I've asked, I've parachuted in the DevSecOps into the DevOps area and I try and steer the DevSecOps and say, this is the direction, these are the objectives I want you to reach over the next three years and give him shorter goals of every six months, right? Aligned to the budgets and the constraints and the risks. I say, right, go for credentials first, then do the static code analysis. Then I know that budgets are coming online and we'll go for dynamic code. And as we're going into vulnerability management, the different techniques, so he is working the DevSecOps with some senior people, DevOps people, cloud architects, and also the project managers. And he will attend the daily, we call it the stand-up meetings and the scrums. The next slide. So I know the guys have touched upon earlier about um, the salary ranges, but this takes it a bit further so right at the top, you may say, how do I get into DevSecOps? So you might be a network engineer, you might be a developer or an IT admin. So you could come in from different areas. And if you're employing several different DevSecOps people, it's good to have a different range of disciplines because I know a network engineer who's going into the DevSecOps might have a different lens to DevOps and I probably want a blend of two because they have different perspectives. But once you're into this funnel, you can accelerate this path, but there's only so much you can condense because you do need a range of different types of projects, different technologies. And what I'll try to sort of on the right-hand side, give you an idea of the sort of technologies you may encounter, qualifications, capabilities, so if it was a network engineer, I'd try and encourage him to look, try and learn Python and Go. They're the two popular languages at the moment in DevSecOps. And that will give you a strong appreciation when you're working with the DevOps teams. And also start doing maybe the, maybe the Comp TI, say, TIA Security Plus. Um, you may be new to security, but often that's a good uh, you know, a starting block. Look at Udemy, there's some very, very good security, security courses there, or Cloud, Cloud Guru. You can get hold of these courses very, very good. Otherwise, if CompTIA security might be 800 pounds plus, but you can start on that ladder quite cheaply with 20, 30 pounds and self-fund it. Um, year two, year three, year four, you can actually see how they grow. So Fran has skipped on to the cloud security architect. This is more of a wider range. So the cloud security architect, so he will be more worried about transforming on, for example, an on-premise application. How do I move that securely to the cloud? How can I do it differently? So you might come from a, an on-premise security architect and he has to learn some new uh, techniques, or it might be a dev who wants to transition into architecture. So you need a different perspective and some sort of different understandings of APIs. You don't need a full in-depth analysis, but you do need a strong appreciation of the building blocks and how to securely join the building blocks. I would strongly advocate um, MITRE ATT&CK. So for those who want to, and this is also works with the DevSecOps, MITRE ATT&CK are, I think, are now becoming one of the reference guides for security people about threat modeling, the types of threats, patterns as well. And they just recently released a set of attack chains and techniques 
for the cloud as well. So it's worth a visit as well, even for on-premise. But you can see it's a strong evolution, constantly learning. And I've gone through this learning chain and I'm constantly learning. So if you're passionate about learning, start on the journey. Brian? Over to you. So I, I can't strongly uh, agree more uh, on the on the continuous evolution and continuous path. Uh, I think we we as a cloud security professional, that's the consistent challenge of learning or being continuously challenged. And uh, as, as Ben was saying before, there is there is kind of a um, a sort of range a gap uh, between security professional DevOps and people who build stuff. And the traditional rationale is with DevOps that gap is getting a little bit smaller because effectively everybody needs to know a little bit about everything. Um, and you can't be, of course, an expert on, on everything, but you need to have a broad perspective. But security is, in the security field, that's even more stressed because you need to have touch point on governance, on how to build things, on how to secure things, on um, application security code and so on and so forth. And the DevSecOps role is very is very representative of that unicorn that knows a little bit everything. But it tends to be more or less an evangelizer. Now, the Cloud Security Alliance starts with a number of knowledge sharing and certification that was the CCSK, uh, Certified Cloud Security Knowledge. Here you go, now it may come back to my mind. <laughs> um, and uh, of recent, the uh, CSA Global uh, published a really good number of uh, learning uh, videos uh, that you can now purchase individually or as a bulk. And right now, I think this is the last day to get it for 20% off. Uh, just as an announcement, we will be uh, auctioning a number of licenses for this training uh, for a best project or a best uh, person or who needs more specifically in this uh, moment of crisis. So we, we reached a kindly an agreement with the with CSA Global to give some license for free for people that are struggling and we will uh, decide uh, who those people will be uh, in uh, as, as an award. We will grant this as an award, but this is, is how we go back to the community and help people that are especially being furloughed or searching or are trying to upskill. Uh, we have different trainings, so we have the CCSK, the CCSK Plus, the Advanced Security uh, Knowledge on Cloud, and then of recent we've been working on uh, the CCAK, of which myself and Stephen are, for example, a panel that is creating this new certification for auditors. So how to string in effectively all the, all the regulation, how to map it in uh, in a cloud environment and how to evaluate. And also we have the counterpart from IC Square that is called the CCSP, Certified Cloud Security Professional, that is very, very similar to the CCSK. The body of knowledge are very, very similar, uh, but it's effectively a vendor agnostic overview of uh, cloud security. So that's more or less the offering that right now we do with the Cloud Security Alliance. And just to touch point on the certification, we have tons of certification available right now. And uh, specifically with their SecOps role, we see that certification is not extremely a requirement. They're just guidance. And this slide is just to tell you which entry points and, and how to evolve in the various certification if you want to follow the route of certification. But continuous learning and continuous uh, evolution is the key in specific cloud role. Um, for recruiter and hiring manager, sometimes they uh, look at certification specifically on, on cloud environment. And this is more or less the landscape. Each cloud environment is starting their own uh, certification part. We have uh, the, the one on AWS that is more popular, very well documented, openly available on uh, practitioner and then you have the specialization in security. Um, GCP is starting and is evolving their specialization as we speak and they don't have uh, one specifically for security at this point in time and uh, Azure is evolving their security certification as we speak and uh, I think you have a specialist, security specialist but I can't remember at the moment. Anyway, 
the security specialist is the security areas tend to be rightfully so more embedded in the various certifications. So as, as a practitioner, as a solution architect, you need to know a little bit more about security because you're building stuff and you need to start learning about building them security. And this is the idea as well of the shift lab to insert effectively security at the very beginning of the pipeline. Now, we have a number of resources uh, available at this point in time. You have, as you're learning, we have AWS uh, Essential Learning that is an enormous amount of library of best practice. Uh, and uh, AWS is really, really good at documenting everything, sometimes overly documenting, but there is no such a thing about over documentation. Uh, GCP has its own offering as well. And from a commercial perspective, you have a Cloud Guru, Cloud Academy, and you have a number of certification on Udemy. Um, from an industry perspective, Securosis that collaborates uh, a lot with the Cloud Security Alliance has built uh, a number of training, has its own training and certification as well. Uh, sorry, not certification, it has its own training and has a very good reference block for uh, pattern blueprint and learning on the job. They're really, really involved. Um, in the Cloud Security Alliance and in the field, as well as Netflix is a massive consumer of AWS service and has been of recent publishing a lot of the reference material um, around cloud, cloud security, and a lot of tool sets that take it with a pinch of salt. They are built for their environment, but they made it available to everybody to, in, in the pure DevSecOps spirit, take it, adjust it to your environment so they're not off the shelf tool you will need to adjust them and tweak it and understand them. And sometimes take it with a pinch of salt because you, you, it might take more time to develop your own one than adapting somebody else. But it's a good reference point to say, this is how a giant solve a problem. Maybe it's not, I don't need to solve that same problem in that same way. But it's a good reference point and so on and so forth. We're going to put all the reference um, in here. But uh, together with that, I want to also give an overview of what uh, uh, free and paid for resource are available around the web. You have OWASP, which is uh, an open source web application security project that has exploded in terms of activities and now has a number of tools that are absolutely critical and absolutely useful, uh, like OWASP, that is a web application proxy, OWASP NetHacker, where you can effectively test your security posture, uh, regardless in the cloud on premises. Uh, cheat sheet that is effectively a suggestion on this is a problem and this is how you fix it. The tendency check that is more specific for your pipeline to verify if your open source components are effectively vulnerable of something. And this is all off the shelf free product that sometimes does need absolutely just a little bit of tweaking. Web code or G Shop, uh, and I really love some or was some because it's a maturity model, a lot of maturity model around application security pipeline. And also from a conference perspective, you have a number of, of conference. So you have a virtual application security day from again, OWASP, where people tend to share a lot of um, absolutely amazing content. Uh, I've been talking in a few uh, of, their, uh, of their conferences, so you can find some of my previous talk, but there is, uh, talks from Netflix about their tool set, uh, talks about how to do threat modeling, tools, talks about uh, cloud security and so on and so forth. And together with that, there is a number of uh, dev and ops and security conference uh, mix like DevSecOps Days, DevSecon and Ado that are really, really good. And a couple of friends of mine that have been really, really active in the community is uh, TLDRSec, that is a, a, an email list on application security with effectively a summary of all the news of the week, really practical, really sealed. She hacks Purple or Tanya Janka, uh, that is a developer heart moved into security and she does a bunch of uh, free content and now she recently launched her course on very, very cheap, $100 course on application security and really top notch. And then uh, practical DevSecOps certification uh, from uh, uh, um, one of my colleague, Imran, that is uh, really one of the top certification on DevSecOps. And then NSC42 ourselves, we offer cloud security training. Uh, we're gonna be a very soon uh, CCSK authorized provider. And of course, DevSecOps and SDLC practical training based on 
uh, what we learn from our clients. Wrapping up, uh, we are searching for more members. We are searching for more people. So come and join us. We are searching for people to organize this event, to advertise this event. The more we can advertise, the better we can do, uh, the more people we can reach. And that's fundamentally the core of what we're trying to do. It, it takes a little bit of time to put this event together to try to distribute it around. And it is absolutely voluntary and basic. And I, I thank with all my heart all the panelists and all the people that are in the back of this event that uh, sometimes you can't see here or sometimes you can't see in the panel, uh, but uh, there is an enormous amount of effort to put these uh, events together. Uh, with all our research, all people that contribute in white paper and blog posts, please Tell us if you want to do and write more about cloud security it is amazing for your exposure. It, it creates a Polish name and you can add it on your CV. It shows that you are passionate about that. You are a leader in your sectors and you guide other people with your knowledge and you do your research. So it's an amazing, powerful tool for yourself, for your network, for your marketing of your profile. So specifically, if you at this point in time are starting in cloud security, are struggling, please do a research on one subject and then publish it in reach us to us for a uh, blog post. We're gonna publish it uh, if it's deemed worth it. Um, we're not going to publish everything. Uh, we're going to, we have a tight selection of the content that we publish, uh, but it's going to be an absolutely uh, uh, marketing tool for you to say, uh, I had the honor to be published. And one of my blog posts, uh, some of my blog posts went up to CSA Global. So we will push the best blog uh, as much as possible to have the maximum outreach. So it will polish up your CV massively. Uh, again, we have the AGM plan. So if you don't want to have a blog post, if you have a talk in cloud security, please do so. Please reach out to us uh, on the various channels or uh, email to us or reach out to LinkedIn to either myself, Ben uh, or Steven and Lewis. Uh, I have to reach out to the community. I have a, a podcast available. We are just uh, going to be publishing on the beginning of the June uh, the new season, we have amazing content between application security, DevSecOps, OSINT, and cloud security, of course. Uh, you can reach out to, if you take a picture right now, it, the website is going to take you directly to the website with all the episode of season one and the next episode of season two. And then we have an award available. Uh, we're going to have a new one for the uh, LMS uh, license, but if you want to be effectively recognized as, a, as an influencer, as a contributor to the community, because you've done something uh, for the community, please uh, submit, your con uh, uh, submit your name and the work you've done on the uh, Cybersecurity Cloud Awards. And we will judge uh, the, cloud, uh, the, the, cyber, um, the Cloud Security Influencer of the Year. So we are just about the hour. So I'm gonna skip the Q&A session, and I'd like to thanks. I'd like to thank Stephen, Ben, Owanate as absolutely amazing panelists for all the work uh, that has been put behind this uh, this workshop. I hope this has been uh, as useful for everybody as it was for me. And uh, I thank everybody and all our guests for, for being here, for listening. It was supposed to be 45 minutes, but we, <laughs> I hope the content was worth the wait and uh, staying here. So I thank everybody. And uh, next event is next week on Wednesday. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day. Learn more and stay safe.